Hello, everybody. So, hi, I'm Lynn Wenzel, and I am subbing for Sheila Hoffman tonight because she is out of town this week. She's our director, and I am um, with Stuart Pesco. We are um, the instigators of the Fall into History series at the uh, Stevens Center on the Common this year. And we're also working on um, speakers and programs for the rest of the year. Um, so uh, welcome to everyone. Um, I'm, the reminders of like, turn your noisemakers off, your phones, and we don't need anything buzzing um, during Sarah's presentation. Um, emergencies, there's an emergency exit where it says exit up there and out through the back and out the front door. It, we don't expect an emergency, but we always like to tell you where they are. Um, we bathrooms are right out the door and to the right. And Sarah will have copies of her book available for sale afterwards. Um, so a couple of things that are also happening at the Warden Theater this fall. So um, we have our next uh, presenter is Professor Abby Chandler. And Abby is a professor at UMass Lowell, and she is very, very local. She lives on Osgood Street. And she will be in um, doing a presentation on November 1st, Wednesday, November 1st at 7.30, called Identity and Rebellion in Pre-Revolutionary America. So um, Abby will discuss the research on the Stamp Act crisis, which led to her new book, Seized with the Temper of the Times, Identity and Rebellion in Pre-Revolutionary America. So if you are a revolutionary war, uh, a revolutionary period um, historical fan, that is the presentation for you. And then coming up on November 16th, um, we have Harvard professor Martin Puckner or Puckner, and I'm not really sure how his name is pronounced, and I probably massacred it both ways. But he is a um, best-selling author, and he will be. His presentation is called "How Stories Shape History," um, and he takes us on a tour of world history to highlight some of the most important stories, from religious scripture to revolutionary manifestos, that have shaped history. Along the way, he will reflect on the human drive to tell stories and how those stories have been adapted to new circumstances. So both of those, you can reserve tickets on our uh, website, the North Andover Historical Society website. There's links there to Eventbrite to reserve a ticket. Um, also coming up, there's two more uh, horror movies this month for Retro Movie Night. Um, so join uh, North Andover Cam and the North Andover Historical Society for retro horror films on Thursday nights during the month of October. The next one is October 19th. This week it's the um, House on Haunted Hill from 1959. And then the... Um, the classic Night of the Living Dead from 1968 on October 26th at, at 7.30. Um, it's free admission, rever reservation suggested, but a suggested donation of $5. So we are thrilled to have um, Sarah Tracy Burroughs with us here tonight to talk about her book and the process that led her to publish it, Yours Affectionately, Osgood. Sarah has been passionate about reading and writing since a young girl. She also enjoys photography and photojournalism. Raised in Syracuse, New York, Sarah is a graduate of Hobart and William Smith Colleges with a BA in English and History. She worked for CFO Publishing Corp in Boston. She's currently president of trustees of the Jacob Leisler Institute, named for her eight-time great-grandfather. Sarah lived in the Boston area for 31 years, specifically Wenham for 18 years and Hingham for seven years, before moving two years ago to Stow, Vermont with her husband, with whom she has three sons, where she enjoys walking her dogs, swimming, hiking, skiing, and spending time with family. So please join me in welcoming Sarah Burns. Thank you all for joining me this evening. Um, it's um, an honor to speak here at the new Warden Theater um, at the Stevens Center on the Common. Um, and um, 
This evening I will um, be sharing with you the life and letters of Colonel Osgood Bose Tracy, my great-great-grandfather, um, who served the Union Army um, during the American Civil War. Um, and in speaking uh, about him in uh, North Andover is special to me, um, as it is the birthplace of his mother and many ancestors um, before her, um, so it does feel very special. Um, inappropriate, I would say. Um, so to begin, um, my journey with my uh, great-great-grandfather began with my maternal grandfather, John Tracy, um, and he lived um, in Syracuse, New York, uh, right around the corner from where I grew up. Um, he lived in the home my mother, Anne, and her two brothers uh, were raised in, and I loved my grandfather, and I loved spending time with him. Um, so I was often over at his house um, where he would lay out on the dining room table um, two scrapbooks of letters containing about 208 letters um, that Osgood had written mainly to his widowed mother. Um, he also placed on the table um, the, mem the war memorabilia such as um, bayonets, swords, rifles, um, and, and that I was all very much drawn to. Um, and sometimes uh, my grandfather explained a battle, um, the lines of battle, he'd bring out the textbook, a textbook, and um, though this interested me, um, it didn't as much as um, Osgood's letters themselves. I must admit, my, my mind began to wander a little at the lines of the battle. <laughs> um, but, um, I, you know, looking at Osgood's letters, I thought his handwriting was the most beautiful I'd ever seen. I was drawn to the old paper and the idea that he had dipped his pen and in ink to write, um, likely under a starlit night or stormy skies, maybe in a tent, um, and all that. And um, and uh, along with all this memorabilia um, on my grandfather's table was this photo album here. Um, and all this other material, um, among other things. And that photo album contains photos of Osgood's family, his comrades, his friends from home, and his sweetheart. Um, and I was particularly drawn to her um, and their story as a young girl. Um, on special occasions, my grandfather let me borrow something, um, such as a dried flower that Osgood uh, picked up on a battlefield and sent home. Um, once he let me take Osgood's mother's scrapbook, um, and I have th that here actually today, um, which she started in um, April 1862, um, and she signed her name, which was Sarah Tracy, um, in that on the first page. Um, and when my grandfather allowed me to take this home, um, it was really special, and I remember being my, in my bedroom as uh, a young girl, and and putting it on the floor, and I took this manila envelope from my desk, and and um, I made a, a jacket cover for it um, because I felt, um, and, I, and I, I was very careful to write very neatly. I got out a ruler and black marker, <laughs> and because I cared about what was inside, I wanted it to be really nice and neat, and I wrote Sarah's scrapbook. <laughs> and it held that um, for quite a long time, and I still have it. Um, so. Now, my grandfather introduced history to me. I mean, he made it sound so interesting that I wanted to live there. Um, to me, the past never seemed far away. I was amazed, for instance, um, that my grandfather's mother, my, my great-grandmother, who I knew very well until I was age 10 when she passed, um, had known Osgood. Um, she had married his son. And so it really dawned on me then. I thought, wow, um, Granny Tracy knew a man who fought in the Civil War. Like, I can touch her, and then she <laughs> touched him. And, and that just really drew it in close for me. Um, and, and made it seem very real. And of course, all this material made it seem very real. Um, one moment with my grandfather stands out like an epiphany. Um, I can still envision it today. Um, he and I were standing hand in hand um, on Cedric Drive in our neighborhood, looking up at the home he grew up in. Um, and 
um, where Osgood would have spent m m a lot of time. And um, he was talking about the part abolition played um, in these letters and, and, and in what was going on with my ancestors and groups, of course, widespread. And, um, and I realized it really dawned on me that these letters were important, this history was important, and I, I was no more than nine or 10 years of age, and I remember thinking they should be published. Um, you know, and I, I envisioned the story in film, and <laughs> right then and there, and um, as a young girl, as Lynn mentioned, as a young girl who loved to read and write, I, I, re I recall thinking I wanted to be the one to make that happen. Uh, and then uh, in, when I was a senior in college, I wrote a senior paper about my experience with my grandfather, and my professor wrote that, um, that he had played a, a, a large part, um, you know, obviously in my life, and, and he felt perhaps in my, my future career, and, and Lynn said I was working for a magazine publishing company in Boston. In my spare time, I transcribed the original letters from an earlier typed written um, transcription that a uh, family member had done into computer and then I fact checked the originals when I had them in my possession. My, they were at my parents' house and, um, and, uh, and went from there and I contacted presses and all sorts of small, large and so forth and I kept meeting roadblocks, editors changed and, and um, and uh, you know, then at that point, the World Wide Web was brand new. It was front page cover in our magazine, and and I could Google. Uh, you know, suddenly I had done a lot of research, um, traveling places, and you know, I just wished then that I could have asked my grandfather for the answers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so um, at that point, uh, later in my twenties, I married. I became very busy raising a family. And I, I began to write a historical novel inspired by these letters and, and story. And, uh, but it always remained very important to me to, um, to publish the letters as Osgood wrote them in their entirety. Um, and, um, and I circled back to that. Um, and in April 2017, I contacted Kent State University Press um, they suggested I collaborate with Ryan Keating, who is a Civil War historian and professor in California um, at San Bernardino, and he is a reader for the press, for other books. They have a, a great Civil War in the North series, if you're interested um, in the Civil War in the North. And uh, he, we collaborated for five years, and this was published a year ago, uh, June. So, um, And before I begin the slides, um, I just will quote my grand, great grandfather, uh, great great grandfather, um, on September 30th, 1863, during his service in the war, um, Osgood wrote home to his mother, quote, I trust you stow all my letters away in my chest, for I wish to preserve them. <laughs> <laughs> So this is my grandfather here, um, holding the framed photo. Um, and this was a, for a newspaper article. His, um, his um, let's see, his daughter-in-law's um, father is standing beside him. He was an interested historian and gun enthusiast. Um, and this is all the material there that my grandfather is surrounded by. Um, this was in 1980. You can see the date of the article there. And um, can everybody hear me OK? Yeah. Yes, OK. Um, this is me a little over a year ago with most of the same material. And that quote that I just read. This is Syracuse, New York, um, an 1852 view of it. Um, and Osgood was born here in this, in this city in Syracuse on June 25th, 1840. Um, as the nation stood on the precipice of war, of civil war, the town of Syracuse, um, though physically distant from the South, uh, slaveholding South, uh, played a vibrant role in, in the national debates over slavery. Um, this was a home Osgood was raised in. 
And this is Osgood's mother, who was born right here. Um, and her name was Sarah Vose Osgood. She's buried here, um, went to her grave beforehand. Um, and um, she was born in 1804. Um, and Sarah moved um, from Andover only after her parents both passed away. Um, she was in her uh, around age 28. Um, and she um, left with her half-sister Elizabeth Osgood Putnam. Um, Elizabeth had uh, married uh, Captain Hiram Putnam of Salem, and he had captained twice around the world um, a ship called the China. Um, in the China trade. And it is said that he, in family letters, that he wanted to get away from the ocean. <laughs> so they, they um, left together and they traveled to Albany, New York, where Sarah Osgood uh, met her future husband, James Grant Tracy, who was born in Norwich, Connecticut. Um, his father, Captain Jared Tracy, um, had been commissary of supplies for the American army during the siege of Boston. Um, in Syracuse, James was a lawyer and land agent, and he and Sarah were married in 1836. Um, I'll mention Osgood's grandfather, um, and um, this was General Joseph Foes. This is actually his son. There's no known, unfortunately, no known um, photograph or, or uh, painting of General Vose. Um, and he was, um, he led the first Massachusetts regiment in the Revolutionary War. Um, Osgood had three brothers. Um, this is the youngest, whom they called Eddie. Um, and Eddie unfortunately died at age six of diphtheria, which was very common. Um, and four months later, um, this was in 1850, um, and four months later, um, their father died. Um, and Osgood at the time was 10 years old. Um, so the loss of uh, father and brother um, profoundly affected Osgood. Um, and of course, he felt a deep responsibility for his mother. Um, 1850 uh, was also the year that the sectional compromise over slavery um, underpin national politics as the strict um, uh, Fugitive Slave Act, part of the larger compromise of 1850, permitted slave owners to pursue escaped um, uh, African Americans across state lines and return them to captivity. Um, This is Osgood's brother, Will, as they called him, William. Um, and at age 18, Will joined the Union Army when it first broke in April 1861. Um, he was mustered in as corporal uh, to the 3rd Regiment, New York. And my collaborator, collaborator, Ryan Keating, says that Will had one of the most varied um, services um, of the Civil War, North or South. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, this is Osgood's oldest brother, uh, James. They called him uh, Jim. And um, Jim um, was working in a coal office, um, and he was about 24 years old at this time. Um, he was always persuaded not to join the war effort. He wanted to, but um, the two other brothers wanted um, you know, someone home with their widowed mother. This is Osgood's sweetheart, um, Nellie Sedgwick. Um, she's age 21 in this photograph in 1862. Um, and she was the daughter of Charles Baldwin Sedgwick and Ellen Chase Smith. Um, Ellen, her mother, died in childbirth uh, during the birth of Nellie's brother, um, Charles, who they called Charlie. And this is her father, Charles Baldwin Sedgwick. Um, he was a staunch abolitionist, and this is why I mention him. Um, he established Syrac or helped establish Syracuse's Vigilance Committee. Um, he helped plan a Syracuse, Syracuse jail breakout of an escaped enslaved man named Jerry. Um, some of you may have heard the Jerry, about the Jerry rescue. Uh, if you Google it, you'll find information on it. Um, it was sort of a precursor to the Civil War. Um, and 
um, Mr. Sedgwick, uh, being a lawyer, represented the eight white men who broke Jerry out of jail. And, and um, that trial went on for two years. Um, he was then elected to Congress, where he was the first man um, to speak on the House floor um, about the, ab um, in favor of abolishing slavery. He was, he was a staunch abolitionist. That was in 1860, a year before the war broke. Um, he married, um, for the second time, um, Deborah Gannett, who was from Boston, um, and one year after the death of his first wife. And um, I mentioned her, she's from Boston, and um, she was um, and, um, studied at Brook Farm School in Concord with Nathaniel Hawthorne. They were lifelong friends. Um, she was a writer. Author, a published author. Uh, she was an uh, abolitionist, and it's thought um, that um, her beliefs made her husband's all that much more strong. Um, and uh, she held abolitionist meetings, and um, she was very forward thinking. This was her home um, they built. Um, and uh, they bought 85 acres of land um, just outside the city limits. This is where I grew up, not in this house. It's unfortunately no longer there, but um, they called it said the farm. Um, and uh, this is, um, the neighborhood now is a historic um, neighborhood with that name. Uh, and that is Dora, the, um, Mr. Cedric's wife there in the sketch in the, in the, on the right, lower right-hand side. So in June 1862, President Lincoln requested 300,000 more volunteers. Um, Osgood was 22 years old. Um, he had wanted to join before, but again, he was uh, wanting to take care of his mother. Uh, he's worried about her. He was um, supporting her in their home. He worked in a bank, so he had a good job. Um, but on August 9th, Osgood enlisted in the 122nd New York um, he was appointed uh, Sergeant Major in Company One. Uh, the regiment was recruited um, in the county of Onondaga and organized in Syracuse. The majority of uh, the regiment men, which totaled um, 1,000, were farmers' sons. Um, his brother Will at this point, whoopsie, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, uh, at this point, Will had been at war uh, 16 months. Um, in the week before uh, leaving home, Osgood proposed to Nellie. Um, he'd had a ring made by a local jeweler, jeweler um, and he stated, it, it is just what I envisioned. He wrote that in a letter. <laughs> um, but Nellie's answer was not what he envisioned. <laughs> she told him, quote, and this was also something Osgood wrote in a letter, which is in the book, Perhaps you should think of me now only as a friend. <laughs> so he must have left for war with a heavy heart. <laughs> and we're left to wonder why Nellie said no. Um, I've found no correspondence that gives me an exact answer. Um, but putting things together, there, there's a good possibility. Um, there was a calamity, um, tragedy, that struck the Sedgwick home, Nellie's family, just four months before Osgood proposed to her, um, and um, Nellie's stepbrother, or half-brother rather, 12-year-old uh, Frank Sedgwick drowned in the backyard in a pond um, that was created by a, a rainstorm and melting snow, um, along with his best friend, um, the son of fellow abolitionist friends, um, nearby neighbors. and. Um, Mrs. Sedgwick was visiting um, Mr. Sedgwick in Washington, and the other couple were at an abolitionist, abolitionist meeting in New York City. Um, and Nellie, being 21 years old, it's very likely, um, very possible, that she may have been at home taking care of them and perhaps felt guilty um, in, about their deaths, and, um, and uh, perhaps she just couldn't say yes to um, an engagement which would afford happiness at that point of time. Um, there was a, a great send-off rally for the regiment, um, and this woman, who's an abolitionist, uh, was an abolitionist, uh, Matilda Jocelyn Gage, spoke, um, and she just had a fantastic speech that she 
um, gave to the 1,000 men regiment, and there were thousands of people that showed up on a hot um, day, um, July 28th, or August 25th, rather. Um, and she said, among many things, let liberty be your watchword and your war cry alike. What caused a war? Slavery and nothing else. Uh, Osgood was mustered in August 28th, um, and this is the first letter that he penned home from Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, the regiment was assigned uh, to the Army of the Potomac, Potomac uh, the Sixth Army Corps, and led by this man, General John Sedgwick uh, from Cornwall, Connecticut. He was first cousin to Charles Sedgwick. So the 122nd Regiment arrived in Sharpsburg, Maryland during the Battle of Antietam, uh, which took place on uh, September 17th. Uh, this one-day battle had the most casualties in American history to date. 22,721 men died in one day. Um, 12,400 were Union. And I'll just read a little bit that Osgood wrote about that. In our last two marches, we have had a chance to see a, a larger proportion of the battlefield, and my ideas are considerably changed. In the first place, I had no idea of the extent of it. I was told yesterday that the line of battle was nearly 11 miles long, only think of it. The wounded had all been removed, but many dead bodies remained, and I think without the least exaggeration, I must have seen over 100 as we passed along the road. These were mostly rebels, and in some places, five or six laid together. It was a rather sickening sight for our green and inexperienced regiment, and gave them a rather realizing view of what they had undertaken. There were any quantities of balls, shells, muskets, etc., lying about, but I wanted to get some momentum of the field to send home, and I finally picked up a Sekish letter. So they did not they did not participate in that battle because they were just arriving, but they they were witness to it. Um, from this point forward, Osgood's correspondence continued unabated, um, except for one period of time, which you'll learn about later. Um, and Osgood's mother uh, began to collect his letters, and at some point, um, they were placed into two scrapbooks, and that is, that's one there. And um, like I said, um, his mother began to keep a scrapbook as well, uh, right here. And, um, and like I said, she, she signed it Sarah Tracy. Um, and she inside, she pasted wartime news, poetry, obituaries, local and national events that interested her. Um, many abolitionist articles are within it. Her own obituary is in it. Um, it states that she was an abolitionist. So just some mementos um, inside um, the scrapbook. Um, these are some of the men Osgood <coughs> served with. Um, many officers he knew beforehand. Um, and um, he, as they grew to know each other, well, they knew each, some knew each other. Um, the man right um, on the top there is, was Frank Worcester, and he, uh, Osgood did not know Frank uh, before wartime, um, and they grew to be, be best friends. Um, and Osgood eventually gave their, their group of buddies um, the name The Old Click. 
And um, I'll say that Frank Worcester, they called him Worcester, um, was a lawyer, had been a lawyer at home. Um, and uh, Osgood described Frank as fun, popular, and convincing. No march could dampen his spirits. Um, during the war, Worcester was sent um, with a, um, to try to convince President Lincoln to stay an execution order for a comrade that had um, um, been ordered, executed for desertion. And, um, and Frank Wister was able to convince President Lincoln um, to stay that execution um, and you know, rode back um, to the camp with five minutes to spare. Um, in the weeks following Antietam, uh, the, the regiment was ordered to chase the enemy. Um, and on November 2nd, it received orders to move south. Um, during the Battle of Fredericksburg, Virginia, on December 11th through the 15th, uh, more than 12,500 Army of the Potomac soldier, soldiers lay dead. Um, it was a Confederate victory with a loss of 6,000 men. Wet weather turned um, the roads to mud, and then winter snows arrived, um, making it, it was a mess. Um, General Ambrose Burnside's attempt to flank General Lee's army came to a halt, and the 122nd settled into winter um, quarters, um, winter camps. And, um, and there, Osgood wrote about camp life itself. There's a lot of information in his letters about what they ate and what they did, and and so forth, and, and all the sort of the, the times that he spent with his comrades and friends. Um, the broader scope of the war and his concern that Nellie, um, who he recently had seen in Washington during this mud march, um, you know, she, he was concerned that she would meet another suitor. He was always concerned <laughs> about um, writing to his mother about, um, you know, where his relationship was with her. And of course, men felt left behind, right? This, and this is still yet early in the war, but. Um, at this point, um, Osgood's uncle died um, unexpectedly. He was Major General Edwin Vose Sumner here. He was from Boston, and he was the oldest field commander north or south. Um, and he was beloved by the Sixth Corps. Um, he, was, he was educated at Milton Academy. Um, and these were his sons, and Osgood was very close to the one um, Sam below here. Um, they wrote each other. Some of their letters are in this book, uh, in his collection, and um, they tried to see each other in field or camp whenever they could. Um, at this time, in the spring, 1863, the regiment encountered uh, enemy pickets, newly liberated slaves, and the destruction of southern plantations. Um, Osgood was promoted to second lieutenant. And that is um, in his sketch there that he sent home. Um, I don't know if you can see it. It says 122nd um, New York volunteer, V for volunteers. And that became their um, the Six Corps Cross, and they, they wore that on their jacket. Oops. So in May 1863, um, Osgood's 20 year old brother Will was an aide to camp um, to the 122nd General Henry Slocum. Um, Will had, um, you know, when he first joined the army, he was in the Eastern Theater um, in a New York regiment, and he was given an officer position because of um, who they knew, and um, he didn't feel right about that. He wrote his mother from a train station in Kentucky that he'd left his regiment, um, and the reason being was because he felt that there were other men um, just as, um, you know, just as um, deserving 
of his position, and he wanted to prove it to himself that he could um, join as a private somewhere where he knew no one. And if he rose in the ranks, he told her he would, and if not, then he would stay where he was. Um, and that's exactly what he did. And um, he proved himself out west um, and then came back. So it was at this point, um, and Osgood was very pleased they were back, he uh, came back to the 122nd. So they were within the same regiment, although they didn't see each other very often, so large. Um, but they were in the same regiment, and uh, during uh, the Battle of Chancellorsville, Will was sent by his general with, um, with a message to deliver to another general, Williams, and um, he was able to deliver that. Um, it favorably changed the course the general took in the battle, and uh, it was growing dark uh, when he left there, and he rode into enemy lines. And he realized it, <laughs> uh, not right away. Um, and um, the general, Confederate General A.P. Hill um, himself yelled, shoot him, kill him. And uh, well, originally asked him to surrender, and Will refused. And that's when he yelled that out. Um, and Will decided to ride down that road to death or freedom. And um, his horse, horse was shot. He was shot in his arm. Um, but he made it into Union lines alive. Um, two days later, four inches of Will's arm bone uh, was removed, rather than the arm itself being amputated by hacksaw. Um, the Surgeon General uh, later deemed um, this, the nature of the wound, the procedure the surgeons followed, and along with Will's subsequent recovery, um, with the use of the arm were of major medical um, significance. And the bone, um, it, it, later, the, it later was housed um, in the Army Medical Museum for surgeons to learn this procedure. Um, and I remember my grandfather telling me that it was at the Smithsonian Institute. <laughs> and I just was so amazed by that, um, sort of amazed and scared. <laughs> um, and that was into the 1980s. <laughs> Um, here are the two brothers, um, and this was shortly after Will's wounding. You can see him holding his arm. Uh, you can see Osgood wearing the Six Corps uh, pin, so that had been made. Um, proudly wearing that, I'm sure. Um, I'll read you a letter that Osgood wrote to his brother Jim, and um, I'll say that so oftentimes, as you know, a son writes his mother, he's pr particularly in wartime, he's not going to tell his mother the de too many details. Um, you know, they, he was trying to spare his mother. So often the letters that he wrote to his brothers or his other um, um, friends um, were, had more detail to the battles and, and so forth than um, those to his mother, and that was very typical, of course, for all, many soldiers. Yesterday afternoon, I received a letter from General Slocum's staff saying Willie was at the Corps Hospital, wounded in the arm. I did not get it until 5 o'clock and immediately asked permission to go, but Colonel Shaler, expecting we were going forward again this morning, refused me. As soon as we got into camp this afternoon, I commenced again and have just succeeded in getting a pass from General Shaler. Um, and we'll start early in the morning. I'm afraid that I may be too late, though, that Willie will have started for Washington. I was thinking yesterday afternoon how fortunate Mother has been um, to have been both, to have had both her boys pass through safely. For not having heard anything from Willie, I presumed he was all right when the orderly brought me the note. So. For this um, wounding, um, for Will, it was life-altering. Um, and it was a turning point in the war for both brothers um, and the family. Uh, 
Uh, after Chancellorsville, the regiment headed towards Pennsylvania um, to a town the men had never heard of before, or most hadn't, called Gettysburg. And I'll read you um, what Osgood wrote um, about um, get on their way there. We left Manchester at dusk on the evening of July 1st, and all through the dreary night pushed on towards Gettysburg. As morning dawned, the sound of the second day's battle greeted our ears, faint at first, but growing more and more distinct as we hurried forward to the assistance of our comrades of the Army of the Potomac. Halting only for the occasional five minutes rest and twice to make coffee, we struggled on through that hot July day, nerved to renewed efforts as the sound of the battle grew louder and louder. We reached the banks of Rock Creek, just in the rear of the battlefield, at two o'clock that afternoon, and rede redeemed the promise our noble Cedric had made the night before. Quote, tell General Meade, he said to the staff officers who brought him the order, quote, tell General Meade I will be at Gettysburg with my corps at two o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Part of our corps was engaged that night, marching on the field in a double quick after their long and arduous march and assisted in relieving the third corps. Our brigade went into Bavoak a little in rear of the front line of battle, sleeping on our arms. We men roused again before daylight and moved over to Culp's Hill, our extreme right, and for a short time, We were in reserve, but Lee was making a desperate attempt to turn our right, and a regiment in front of us, having got out of ammunition, we were ordered, ordered forward to take their places. We charged across the knoll and reoccupied the breastworks, which, with other regiments on our right and left, we held against their repeated charges until they abandoned their attack in despair. So that was written post-war, um, but uh, Osgood did write his mother um, on July 4th, 1863, which was the day after the battle. Um, the Battle of, Oz, uh, battle of um, Gettysburg took place July 1 through the 3rd, and he wrote his mother um, on July 4th. Eleven AM. Dear mother, we had a hard fight yesterday. We had seven men killed, which turned out to be ten. Um, Thirty one wounded, besides Major Davis who had his jaw broken, and Lieutenant LaRue who was wounded in the thigh. They were the only officers who were wounded. Two men, one each side of me, were wounded, etc. But I escaped unhurt. Our regiment behaved splendidly. We were at this time attached to the 12th and were fighting side by side with the 149th behind the same wall. Was it not a remarkable coincidence that these two regiments should have met for the first time in such a place? Uh, Major Randall of the 149th New York uh, had just shaken hands with me before he was hit. We drove the rebs away from the stone wall by which they lay by the heavy fire behind our breastworks. The rebs were repulsed at every point, and on our left, their loss is very heavy, much more so than ours. We have taken a large number of prisoners. And then this quote, all is quiet this morning. I guess we had our celebration yesterday. Oh, and P.S., I enclose a wild rose picked up on the field and an old execution order. He wrote his mother later in the day, too. Um, but we'll move on here. Um, so they got through Gettysburg, and then it was fall, and the weather turned cold. Um, and the regiment was no closer to Richmond than it had been the year before. Um, and at this time in Osgood's letters, um, 
Uh, he reflected on the United States Colored Troop, um, the USCT, regiments added um, to the Union cause. Um, his minister, Unitarian minister at home, um, Joseph May, who's actually um, was from Boston, um, um, was an abolitionist. Um, his sister, just to put it in perspective, um, many of you have heard of um, the Elcotts, um, Bronson Elcott, Abigail, his wife was Abigail May, um, and she and this Unitarian minister were brother and sister. And he would mail abolitionist material to Osgood, which he would send out to the men. Um, Um, and it is clear from Osgood's letters that um, his abolitionist beliefs grew stronger as the war continued. Um, as the new year dawned, uh, the regiment received orders in the middle of the night to board a train. They didn't know where they were going. Um, this was a cause for concern at first for them. Um, but the men soon learned they were on their way to Ohio <laughs> um, to guard a prison there on Johnson's Island in a town called Sandusky. Um, and it was a, a prison, this prison here, um, for Confederate officers. Um, and some of them had recently been escaping, so they needed um, to make sure it was guarded. Um, they needed more men, so they sent the entire regiment um, the train filled with excitement at this news. Um, uh, the men sang J uh, John Brown, and the train stopped in a town where the men got off, they were allowed to get off, and they bought uh, spirits. Um, Osgood wrote that they had too many spirits. He, he said, he told his mother that he did not imbibe. He wanted to keep his head about him to, um, to um, keep the men under control. Um, and uh, they reached Sandusky finally, and um, they crossed Lake Erie in blustery cold wind. Um, the privates were housed here in these bunkers, and the officers were allowed to choose their place um, where they would live for the next few months in town. Um, and of course, that must have been exciting for them, um, going from the front lines to um, you know, a house or what have you, a real bed. <coughs> Um, this is a post-war note from Osgood, um, and he wrote, the rebel prisoners were well-fed, clean, comfortably housed, and well-treated, in great contrast to the condition and treatment of our poor fellows confined in southern prisons. A letter from his landlord, he lived in town, um, and um, other than that quote there, um, he, uh, she wrote, the Sanduskians have contracted a life interest in the three months acquaintances brought so unexpectedly to our doors in obedience to the orders of Uncle Sam, whose stay with us has opened new avenues to our thoughts and affections. Um, many men uh, made new uh, friends in town, of course. Um, some. Um, met women there that they ended up marrying later. Um, so there are all these neat stories. Um, and later letters from Osgood, um, once they were back, um, back um, when they left um, duty there, um, it was very clear that um, he had been writing regularly. And it's, it's a shame, the letters, this is the section that there are no letters. Um, and I, my collaborator and I think that perhaps that they were disposed of, um, you know, for whatever reason, and, and perhaps by Osgood himself. Um, we'll never know, but um, um, his mother was able to visit, which was nice, too. I'm just going to plug in my computer because I forgot. <laughs> and I don't, I wouldn't want it to go out. Excuse me. I think if it will reach. good to go. <laughs> um, 
so they, he uh, wrote, Osgood wrote, I'll just uh, read it in case someone can't read it from there. Uh, we returned to the Army to find them preparing for Grant's Richmond campaign, but our long line of 1,000 men with which we left home less than two years before had dwindled away. We probably had less than 400 men fit for duty when we started on that bloody campaign. And again, I think this was a major turning point in the war. Um, in his letters, um, um, you see the, the, the time. It's now been two years, and they're losing friends. Um, at this point, um, Osgood had recently been promoted to lieutenant and adjutant. Um, and um, what remained of the 122nd cast into the fray, um, engaged with the enemy more often than at any time prior in their service. <laughs> it didn't take long for things to ramp up. Um, during the Battle of the Wilderness in Virginia, which took place um, May 5th through the 7th, uh, 1864, um, the regiment lost 119 men killed, um, countless others injured and captured, um, including Osgood um, on May 6. And just a bit about um, the wilderness in Virginia, the woods, it's tangly um, and, it, you know, very tight and um, from all the gunfire, the woods was on fire. Um, it, there was great chaos. And um, Osgood got separated uh, from his regiment. And um, he went off to find, try to find them. And he ran into one of his comrades, Richard, um, <laughs> James Gear. I always want to say Richard Gear. Um, James Gear, who had, was a farmer at home. And I'll just read you Osgood's own description. Um, So the line under fire from so many directions rapidly broke up, and finding none of my regiment in my vicinity, I started through the woods when I met Captain James Gear of the 122nd. We concluded our best move would be to go to our old rear and thus work around in hopes of finding our regiment. It was rapidly growing dark, and we had gone but a short distance when we were surrounded by about 20 Rebs and ordered to, quote, throw down our arms, which consisted at that time of our swords. So from there, um, after being, um, they were rounded up with other prisoners, and um, they headed to Lynchburg, Virginia, uh, to the Warwick House. The officers um, were sent there. Um, many, many of the men were sent, um, privates, others were sent to um, Libby Prison, which was known for starvation and death. Um, just want to read you a little bit about um, among those um, of our regiment who were taken prisoners that night, and this is written post-war, this part, um, were um, comrades Ostrander, Hubs, Mander, Manzer, and Austin. The three former were wounded, and both Ostrander and Hubs had amputations of the leg and foot, performed by rebel surgeons. They were then sent off, Austin was sent to Libby Prison, where um, Osgood, um, at a later date, wrote um, that his friend Austin, his last name was Austin, um, said, you know, you may know what it's like to be hungry for a few days, but um, most people don't know what it's like to be hungry for months. Um, um, so 
So they were taken back a short distance, as he wrote, um, a line of guards placed about them. And at Lynchburg, the officers were quartered in the second story of a block on the principal street. There was one stairway leading uh, from the street to a square hallway in the center of the building. Um, from this hallway, a door led to some rooms in the rear where most of us were quartered. The room I was in was a small one. And when we were disposed for the night, uh, we covered the floor. Uh, there were no mattresses furnished. Um, leading from this same hall to the front of the building were two rooms, one occupied by the rebel provost marshal, who had charge of the prisoners, and the other by some of our uh, two um, generals that had been taken as well. Uh, we were allowed one or two at a time to cross the hall to the general's room, uh, there being a guard stationed at the head of the stairs leading to the street, which was near the door to our room. Now, at this time, in the room where Osgood was, he met um, a Lieutenant Mortimer Birdseye, who was with the 149th New York, and they decided to make a plan of escape. Um, they wanted to wait. They wanted to learn the layout of the, the Warwick House prison. Um, Birdseye um, was able to find a, a war map and a layout of Lynchburg. Um, they knew there was a bridge outside this prison. Um, there may or may not be a guard there. And Osgood wrote, uh, we had in the backyard to which we were allowed access a sort of kitchen where our daily rations were, rations were served, provided only with a, a Negro cook. Feeling sure of his fidelity, I went to the cook. I told him I would give him $10 of Confederate money if he would bring me a rebel jacket the next night, which he did. Um, Sorry, just lost her. Bringing me a coat, which was apparently equal in value to the Confederate money I gave him, but which was worth its weight in gold to me. We were now about ready to start, but waited a day or two to learn, if possible, more about the town. Lynchburg is situated on the south side of the James River, being connected with the northern shore by a long covered bridge, which we could see from our window. We learned from cautious inquiries that there were no guards up on the bridge. Um, meanwhile, our daily rations consisted of a loaf of rye bread, about four, six inch cube, and a small piece of fat boiled bacon. I must confess, I was not hungry enough to eat the bacon. <laughs> We were getting impatient, though, and the 14th of May, a Saturday night, he wrote, we decided to start. I was anxious um, to start. Um, and so they went on, and um, Birdseye has, had succeeded in getting a war map, as I mentioned, of Virginia, and at dusk that evening, getting permission to go to the general's room for a moment, we slipped off our coats, their um, Union coats, and put on our rebel jackets and cloth hats, and coming on as though from upstairs, boldly walked past the guard, whom Captain Gear, James Gear, um, by previous arrangement, was busy, busily engaging in conversation. Rapidly, we went down the stairs into the street. They basically went out with a, the, this other the prison um, guards. They fell in line um, with the Confederate guards. Um, we had gone but a few steps when we met the sergeant of the guard, whom we saw daily in the prison, but realizing that his face was more familiar to us than ours would be to him, we walked coolly past him. Um, and they walked to the bridge. And, and from there, um, their story um, goes on um, for 18 days, um, 17 nights dressed as Confederates in um, enemy territory. Um, and in uh, the description, they um, post um, trek uh, 200 miles north to Harper's Ferry through um, many um, different counties. Um, um, you know, there's so many stories. They had to look for food. They went to plantations. They met people who helped people um, you know, they were nearly shot at at other times. Um, 
they they had said they were with a North Carolina regiment, and some people didn't think they spoke Southern enough, and and so there were always these risks. They met um, the Mosby group, and um, but it's it's really interesting the the track that they were on. Of course, on the home front, um, there was a lot of worry. Um, Osgood was missing in action, and. Um, for weeks, they didn't know um, what had happened to him. Um, it was reported he had been captured and injured. Um, many people wrote letters on his behalf um, to find out any information they could um, for particularly his mother. Um, his mother, uh, Mrs. Tracy, actually wrote Osgood uh, a letter not, never knowing if he would receive it. Um, and I'll read you that letter. My dear darling boy, you can well imagine the overwhelming anxiety which is torturing me today. And although I received your kind letter that last evening, noticing my birthday and exhorting me to try not to feel anxious, I have not succeeded, but feel as if I can hardly bear the state of suspense to which I am doomed. And her birthday, by the way, was in April. So you can see it's been weeks and she just got his letter. Um, the news we have far, so far received is meager, but fills me with alarm as we learn there has been severe fighting and that 4,000 on our side have been wounded, including several officers of high command. Uh, Captain Cossett, one of his close friends, Osgood's close friends, called last evening on his way to Washington. He thought the Sixth Corps had not been seriously engaged, but I saw that they had crossed, I saw they had crossed immediately after the 5th, much to my surprise. I have not received a line from Willie since he arrived at Vicksburg. And then I'll read a letter from Frank Worcester that he wrote to Mrs. Tracy, trying to calm her fear and anxiety, as a good friend would do. On the day, I'll just jump to, on the day Osgood was last seen, uh, we were on the extreme right of our line of battle in occupation of rifle pits. Our right flank was turned by the enemy, thus compelling us to evacuate our works, and the enemy appearing a little to our rear at the same time created some confusion. The men became panic-stricken, Going towards the center of our line, about 500 yards from our original position, I found General Shaler, General Seymour, and other officers making great efforts to stop the men in their flight and force them in a line of battle running perpendicular to our line of earthworks in order to stay the progress of the enemy, who were all the time steadily advancing and pouring into us a heavy fire of musketry and also using some light artillery. While doing what I could to assist in rallying the men, I met Osgood similarly employed, his features glowing with patriotic excitement. We instinctively grasped each other by the hand and bidding each other Godspeed, parted about five minutes after that I observed the enemy whose line of battle overlapped ours, swinging around our right to our rear and communicating that fact to those in the vicinity, we fell back. Then, near the center of our line, near General Shaler, where I have no doubt Osgood was, were captured by the enemy. Two men of my company saw the general captured and were themselves taken prisoners, escaped. They saw nothing of Osgood but say that the fire in front closed for a short time. If as I have no doubt he is a prisoner, I have cause to congratulate you rather than sympathize with you. As, as, we have since, uh, as we have since were and for the next few weeks are likely to be subjected to so much hardship and danger that a slight wound or being taken prisoner is regarded as a fortunate incident which may well excite envy. 
If, on the contrary, he is met with a more serious disaster, my own feelings are such as to convince you that it would be more than useless for me to attempt to console you. I shall have lost my most valued friend, the cause of liberty and justice, one of its most gallant, brave, and devoted defenders, and you, more than all, a talented and affectionate son. So while those letters were being written, um, the men were trekking, the two men, um, and their stories abound. Um, uh, when they did finally arrive um, to Harper's Ferry, um, Osgood later wrote that he was so exhausted that he leaned up on a rock um, and the sentries that were guarding, um, you know, heard something and um, and it drew attention to Bird's Eye, actually. And Bird's Eye was nearly shot, um, but they did, they did both survive and they, they, um, they made it home. And this was a um, telegraph that Mrs. Tracy fortunately received. Um, um, and this was on June 1, um, in which she learned that Osgood um, had been imprisoned and that he escaped and was safe in Washington. Sadly, um, the same day Osgood returned to Union Lines, he learned his best friend Frank uh, was killed um, at the Battle of Cold Harbor. Um, he and Alexander Poole, a comrade, close friend of theirs, was standing beside, um, beside him. Um, it was early in the morning um, and they were looking for the enemy um, hiding behind the pickets, and they were shot by snipers. Uh, Poole lost his arm, and um, Frank Worcester lost his life. Um, and I'll just read you something here. So, iron you know, ironically, it just written Mrs. Tracy saying that Osgood was fortunate to be in prison and, and perhaps that was so. Um, certainly, um, it, 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 you know, Frank was at that next battle. Um, but um, Osgood wrote, um, um, when he wrote, later wrote about um, being in the Battle of the Wilderness, and he wrote, I couldn't read it earlier because I didn't want you to know what happened, but at this moment I met for an instant as we passed engaged in our respective duties my best friend, Lieutenant Frank Worcester. We instinctively grasped each other's hand and it proved to be our last farewell. For in a few moments I was a prisoner and the very day I reached our, poor, our lines, poor Worcester was killed at Cold Harbor. And he missed him all of his life, of course. He, very tough. Um, when Osgood um, did reach Syracuse, New York, he had a two-week, I think it was a two-week furlough um, to rest. And, um, and he was welcomed home a hero, as was Bird's Eye in his hometown outside of Syracuse. Um, Osgood was interviewed for a newspaper article. Um, and uh, it was this article um, is in one of the scrapbooks, um, and all of the script is in the book, um, and it details everything, everybody they met, and the situations they came upon on that trek, um, which are pretty neat. Um, and um, this sword inscribed with his name was a gift from the citizens of Syracuse. Um, for their appreciation. Um, and after his furlough home, he headed back um, for the remainder of the war. Um, the end of the war uh, was in sight. Um, in the winter of 1865, the regiment settled into trenches around Petersburg. They were back there again. Um, at this point in time, it seemed to me that El um, Nellie and Osgood were writing more often. Um, 
and he would visit her, you know, in, on his furlough home, or very often he would write her. Um, she was often in uh, Washington uh, visiting her father uh, while he served in Congress, so he was always trying to meet up with her. Um, another tragedy, uh, of course, was uh, when President Lincoln was assassinated so close to the end of the war. Um, on April 15th, 1865. Um, this man here is, is Charles Sedgwick um, and uh, Nellie's father. Um, and he was a close friend of President Lincoln. He was chosen one of, of um, several people to be on board the train with uh, Lincoln's body as um, the train went around the northeastern states. Um, and when it stopped in Syracuse, uh, Sedgwick, um, delivered a eulogy there to thousands in the street. And I, I kind of focused in on him there. Um, the, the photo itself is fantastic. People are everywhere in the streets, and they're in the buildings, and um, um, you know, mourning their president, of course. Um, you know, the soldiers were excited at this point. They knew the war was coming to close. Um, but they were also very anxious about uh, going home again, um, as all veterans are. Um, and, uh, you know, they left their home years ago, uh, three, four years ago, and they left their jobs. Their jobs were no longer there. They didn't know how they would fit into society again. Um, very uh, concerning for them whether, you know, they debated many, um, whether they'd continue in service. I mean, Asga did. He, he wondered if he should stay in. Um, one of his good friends who wrote him often in his letters, his name was David Murray. Many of his letters are in there. And um, he wrote, you must go home now and comfort your mother who has spared you for so long. You have already enough hairbreadth escapes to entertain your grandchildren with. <laughs> And he took his advice. Um, and this is the last letter from war. And I'll just read the very end of it. Um, this letter was written on May 11th, 1865 from Danville, Virginia. And just in closing, he wrote his mother, well, good night to you. And may you dream of the good times coming when we shall all be together once more. Yours affectionately, Oz. And if you can read the quote there, I don't believe there will be any desire to attempt another rebellion until the memory of this shall um, have perished, perished, which will at least ensure peace to my great grandchildren. And he was mustered out uh, June 23rd, 1865, and the regiment headed home. So he had to determine what he was going to do. And Osgood um, took a job with a company called C.C. Loomis and Company, which was a coffee company, co coffee wholesale company. And um, you know, it's interesting, Osgood, um, you, you would note in the letters, he was he talks about, a lot about coffee and, um, and also that his friends loved his mother's coffee. They, they would pant for it, they said, um, you know, in thinking when they were off at war, thinking about her making that coffee at home and smelling it. And her interest um, came right from right around here um, when she watched her um, brother-in-law sail that ship in to Salem with all that coffee and tea and spices. Um, so that was all very important to this family. Um, and so he took a passion and, 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 um, and, and went um, to work at it. Um, he and Nellie were married. <laughs> she said yes. <laughs> um, on June 19th, uh, 1867, um, two years after arriving home almost, um, and a reception was held at the Cedric home. Um, they had four sons, wonderfully. Um, and this was their daughter, Sarah, who they called Sally. Um, and that is Nellie, about age, probably about 
age 35, and I think that's a locket with Sa Sally in it. Um, sadly, she, Sally died of diphtheria um, at age, um, I think she, age four. Um, so that must have been a sad reminder for Osgood of his loss of his um, little brother of the seam. Um, Post-war speeches, um, he gave many. Um, actually, I, I have some here of my, this wasn't plugged in, I would hold it up. Um, and um, he spoke to young audiences, um, and um, that, this also is um, uh, a wartime ex experience um, uh, article there that was published. Uh, and this was Osgood about um, age 45 at a reunion right in Syracuse in 1885. Um, his brother Will, William, um, he also returned from war um, and he was awarded a Congressional Medal of Honor um, later in the 1800s, I've forgotten the date, um, but um, and for that deed at the Battle of Chancellorsville. And his account is in uh, the Deeds of Valor book. Uh, I think there are two volumes, and um, that's his story, which is pretty neat from his perspective in his own words. Um, and he was a great writer, Will. Unfortunately, I don't know where his letters are, other than the ones that are in Osgood's collection. Um, it doesn't, um, I would have thought, of course, that Mrs. Tracy would be um, keeping his letters as well. Um, um, he married later in life, um, no children, perhaps they just, you know, some people decided not to save things. Um, I would have loved to have read his letters. Um, he was a great writer, and just, I'll read you this portion um, of a speech he gave, um, just so you can hear his voice a little. Um, we shall never cease to feel a thrill of pride, so long as we continue to breathe, that in the morning of our lives, when everything was at its brightest and its best, when the dew was on the flower and the night was on the wave, when life was still, quote, the rose's hope while yet unknown, that we were willing to sacrifice it all. We were willing to give up the full pleasures of this world, which we had just begun to experience as men, to throw down our work, to destroy our careers we had marked out for ourselves. Our lives were as sweet, our happiness as dear to us then as life is now to the men who walk our streets today. We were willing to send, surrender all without hesitation. He and Osgood um, um, fought for veterans' rights. Will particularly was upset. He thought the state of Massachusetts um, was doing a much better job than the state of New York um, by uh, putting up um, monuments to their regiments. And um, at the 24th reunion in Syracuse, um, he put down $500 for a monument to be um, um, raised and um, people filed suit and um, and uh, the following year at the 25th um, uh, reunion of Gettysburg, the 122nd monument was there and Osgood read his speech there um, for that, um, which is right there and right there. <laughs> um, I mentioned that Osgood and Nellie had four sons um, one um, married um, a Southern gale. Um, he was a Cornell student, um, and she had traveled to, to Cornell from Rome, Georgia. Um, my great grandmother, who I mentioned in my intro, um, and um, she was visiting a cousin, and she was engaged. <laughs> she broke the engagement off and married a, a northerner. Um, and they were married in Rome on her family plantation, Illahi. Um, and um, her father and her two brothers fought in the Confederacy, um, her father and Stephen's rifles. And my Granny Tracy um, said that people would ask her what was, um, you know, what was, um, what was it like there? What was the atmosphere like at the wedding? It was 36 years after the war ended, and she said it was cordial but cool. 
Um, Osgood and Nelly returned south. Osgood wanted to see his prison again. Um, and they went with um, Lieutenant Birdseye and his wife. Um, they made it a trip um, in 1902, not long before Osgood died. And um, they found it, sadly, taken down. But they, they rode in um, automobile <laughs> on their 200-mile trek. And they met people that had taken them in. Um, so certainly things were friendlier than they were um, when they were there dressed as Confederates. Um, this is Mrs. Tracy later in life. Um, and uh, she died at age 97, two weeks after driving her two favorite pair of horses. Um, and um, so she enjoyed conversation with young people. And again, she was an abolitionist. Um, this is Osgood and Nellie with their eldest grandson um, of given the Osgood name. Um, and he um, was nicknamed Otz. He was my great uncle Otz, and I remember him. <laughs> Um, this is a coffee container from O.V. Tracy um, Coffee Company. There, if, you, if you Google them, you can find them sometimes on eBay. We have several in our family. Um, and this coffee business um, continued through 1950. My grandfather helped run it. Um, and um, my mother and her 22 extended cousins, um, whenever um, the parents could catch a few after school or on weekends, would fill the tins. I remember her telling me that. Um, so kind of fun. Uh, this is a painting of Osgood and Nellie in later years, which hung in my parents' dining room. And, um, and I'll just read you this here. Um, and this is just my perspective of, um, you know, this 50 plus journey, year journey I've been on um, brought um, my great great grandfather alive to me, all of his, um, his parents and family and comrades and, um, and friends. You know, there's so many le collection of letters in here from friends and Nellie, of course. Um, and, um, you know, as I conversed about all this, because um, I have been interested in it since my grandfather shared it, I felt as after my grandfather was gone, I felt like I was becoming him um, with my own family, my 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 husband, my kids, my parents, and um, and I realized, you know, I as time went on, this was so important for me to get this, uh, get Osgood's letters published. Um, I felt like if I didn't in my generation, I wasn't sure if my, my own kids would, um, because they didn't know I had this connection. And um, so I just felt like it was important to do. Um, but I would say 50 years um, or less um, after my grandfather first shared our ancestors' history with me, the Civil War still resonates the same way it does. Um, I certainly know more details and I understand that better. Um, but um, I'd say I, I think these letters and those like them, historic letters, teach us about our material, um, teach us about those who wrote them, their loved ones, their hardships, and the state of the country when they were written. And history itself enlight helps enlighten us, not only to our past, but our present and our future, um, enabling us to make informed decisions for ourselves, communities, and country. Um, I'm pleased, like I said, to have um, made my dream come true of publishing Osgood's letters. Um, but most of all, I'm extremely proud of my ancestors, their brave comrades, and their families who volunteered to help create a nation of free men and women. Thank you. <laughs> I would be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Yes. Lieutenant, but then the war was over, he left up. So how did he get promoted? Yeah. 
the colonel, the colonel uh, C came later, I believe. Yes. So he no, never was the colonel of the after the war, and I, I don't remember the year. I, I would have to look that up. So he, he wasn't still in the Army, but he got promoted? Yes, correct. Oh, interesting. And, you know, I need to look back at that because I've forgotten when. Um, I mean, I just, it just kind of jumped out. And the other thing was, wait, what's the coffee company, the spice company? Was it called the Tracy Company then, or did it become that because he took it over? He took it over. He, yes, it, he, it was C.C. Loomis and Company. Um, and then he, um, and it changed, certainly. Um, it was many years, you know, and then he, um, he was running it. And yes, then the name changed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So, um, as I mentioned in my 20s and years of age, um, when I was first working in Boston is when I uh, began looking for um, a press. And, um, you know, I knew it, it would be a nonfiction inclusive of the letters. And, um, and that went on for years. I had editors that would say, um, you know, we're going to publish just portions of um, the letters and then, you know, create um, information around it about the war. And so I created a manuscript like that, and then that editor left, and then the press wasn't interested in it. And, and again, it, I, I really wanted to have the letters published as they were. So I, I believe things sometimes happen when they should. Um, and... Um, but year, I mean years, and I reached out to, I had a list of presses, and I don't know, you know, it's how many, I can't remember now how many said no. Did you form a list of I did, yes. Right. Way back then, and then, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yes. And, you know, you just keep at it. Um, I, I, I would say it was on and off. I'm sorry? Yes, yes. Mm hmm Researching and... You didn't lose any time. No. Really looking at publishers because you were moving along with the Right, right. But also with this um, type of manuscript, with letters, you know, I, I wasn't sure what a press would want. Um, and I would say um, the collaboration was key because I'm not a Civil War historian. I'm interested in it, but again, I'm not so... I just, I'm not educated in that. Um, and so I needed that collaboration. And it, in the book, um, basically, each chapter has an introduction um, written by my collaborator about the war and what was going on. Um, you know, so it's sure to be correct. And, um, and um, you know, I wrote um, the introduction and the epilogue and, and certainly brought all the information um, to him. Um, so, you know, it, it, it was years. I, I, I don't remember, but it's, you know, like you hear that um, so best-selling authors say, oh, they had 60 no's. That, that's, that's right. For, um, you know, and, and usually that's the case. It's very difficult to get published. I did not realize. I mean, and of course, today we, we can self-publish, you know, which is a fantastic um, um, choice, too. It, it depends on the project. I'm sorry, I missed that. Um, we were working with another press, um, too, but we went with Kent State. And I had others, you know, Syracuse University. Um, I thought, boy, that would be great. Um, they, at the time, were publishing different types of books. Um, they didn't really want letters. Um, so, you know, it just, um, but Kent State, I'm pleased with, and, and we decided on them. And that collaborator came with that publisher, He didn't really. He, in fact, he, he, we were looking at other presses. He is a reader for their Civil War in the North series, which means they, um, like, you know, we had a reader for our, some, two, uh, I think they have three to four 
uh, readers who we, we never know who they are. And they, they read for the press and say, you should publish this or you shouldn't, and for whatever reason. And then we would get back um, feedback, um, what we should do differently, what we're doing right. Um, I reached out to Jan um, James McPherson. I don't know if you know him. Um, of him, he, is, he wrote Battle Cry of Freedom. Um, he is a, a um, expert, <laughs> extreme expert on the Civil War. Um, and I reached out to him, and he kindly read it um, early, early on, and um, gave me a quote, um, which is on the back cover, um, which was wonderful. Um, you know, and um, it's just a long road of reaching out for those blurbs um, and, um, you know, again, writing a historical novel. I'm still, I'm editing that. I mean, my hope, I'm actually currently working on my next manuscript. Um, I've trans, we've transcribed Cedric's letters. Um, he's my third great grandfather. And, um, and they're, they're actually housed somewhere to rare books, um, uh, library, but I convinced them 15 years ago to photocopy the years that he was serving in Congress, and they're fantastic letters. They're interesting from the standpoint they were written from Washington home to his wife on Cedric uh, on the farm, and he talks about all the politicians, that, particularly the ones he was frustrated with, because he he always said no compromises and no concessions. Many of them were they would um, compromise on the slavery issue, and he wasn't willing to compromise at all. And so there are a lot of interesting things that he says about, you know, a lot of um, uh, state representatives. So, and then it's also the human aspect. He's right, you know, he lost his son, right, in the drowning, and three days later, he's back, or after the funeral, he's back in Washington, said they had to fight on. Um, so, you know, that's another, another avenue I'm going down, but they're related. I'm sorry? Do you think you'll shop that around in the same way? I may do it a little differently. I might do it a little differently. Yes? Well, it's interesting. I, I wasn't the first to transcribe the originals. Um, that man standing with my grandfather in the first slide um, was, and or, or that I know of anyway. And it was so it was a typed transcription to typewriter. And so I could easily read the letters. Um, and I had a copy. And then I transcribed those into computer. And then, of course, I had to fact check the originals. Um, twice, and then even when we were going to press, it was like constant look back at the original to check something because it had to be accurate as possible, and it is. Um, so I don't. I mean, gosh, um, you know, when when I finally had these in my hands because they were housed at my parents' house, and I lived in Boston or where have you, Wenham nearby here, and. Um, you know, I'd travel and I'd spend time with my parents, but there was never too much time um, to go over them. So when I had them in my hands um, for this project, um, it just really, I mean, they're just um, no particular letter or anything. I, I, I don't know, just uh, the whole thing just, you know, it's sort of amazed me my whole life, I guess. But, yeah, it's been a journey, and um, I will say that um, the letters have now been donated um, with a lot of thought um, and concern because these have been handed down generations of my our families, and um, and I felt, you know, now I'm like my parents, worrying what's going to happen to them, and I look at my three sons, and I know I'm sure they'd take care of them, but then who knows, or you know, so anyhow. Um, they are at the Onondaga Historical Association in Syracuse. Um, and, um, you know, I was sure um, that I protected them still. Uh, I have a nice contract, you know, stating um, that they can never be sold because that does happen um, sometimes at some historical um, organizations. And, um, and um, 
it actually did happen to some of our family material at one point. So I was, I I didn't make that decision um, lightly, and I and I and I um, I'm very pleased um, working with the OHA as it's called. Um, they're going to eventually have exhibits um, and with more of the material. Um, you know, of course, I wanted to wait to to donate them until the book was published because it's supposed to be based on private letters. Um, so, and of course, you know, my, my mom has been gone six years. Um, that it's in our line, my maternal side, and my dad was anxious to know what was going to happen to them. And I kept saying, just, we have to wait until the book is published. I've come way too far. <laughs> so anyway, it's, it's funny. It's, it's the book is published and then there's still there's you know there's still things to do i mean which is fun i don't think um sometimes my husband says well are, is the book's done <laughs> it's finished i'm like well that's just one part <laughs> and now it's fun doing this and um you know looking to what else um well, i'll do <laughs> so and I, I still dream that, um, you know, I think I'll, my hope is to get Cedric's letters published because it's sort of, it all goes together. And um, then maybe, you know, the historical novel um, or go straight to a film. I think a lot of this is, is made for film. Um, but that was my dream as a little girl standing with my grandfather. So we'll see. <laughs> but yeah, any more questions? Thank you for coming tonight. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>